Point of View is sponsored by First National Bank. First National Bank, how can we help you? Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television here in Ghana. My name is Bernard Avle. On The Point of View, we pick the right topics, we get the right guests, ask the relevant questions on issues that matter to you. We're live, it's interactive, and we're dealing with a huge story. And tonight we want you to tell us what you make of that story on the basis of how we discuss it. Send us your comments via WhatsApp on the number on the screen. And also, let's hear from you. If you're watching on Facebook or any of the social media platforms, feel free to comment. So I'm going to do a quick review of a big, big story that was published by Africa Confidential. And then I'm going to speak to the journalist who wrote the story. I'm going to speak to a former director general of the Ghana Ports uh, and Harbors Authority. And then I'll speak to a former unionist who was very uh, vocal during this story. So it's going to be huge. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So tonight we're looking at a story that has been followed by the Ghanaian media in bits and pieces, but really brought home by Africa Confidential, which has been reporting since 1960. It's a very respected uh, international magazine. The special report was authored by uh, Andrew Wire. I, did, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. And it was titled, How Bolori, or Vincent Bolori, Bolloré won control of Ghana's biggest port. And the, the report is here. We'll show you parts of the report. And then the, the intro says, French billionaire Vincent Bolloré added Tema to the 15 West African ports he already controlled by ripping off the country, a secret report by Andrew Wire. I'll be speaking to Andrew, who's live, joining me via Zoom. I'll also be speaking to Richard Anamu, who is a former Director General of the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, Who's, who knows a lot about this story. It was quite instrumental in some of the things that happened. And then I'll also speak to Daniel Osu Kranting, former General Secretary of the Maritime and Dock Workers Union, who also has been following the story. But I want to spare you all the, the many, many pages for, for Andrew D. So I've done a quick summary of what I gather from Andrew's report. So it, it raises essentially five issues. Okay, so we know that the... There's been a deal, was, a deal was signed between Meridian Port Holdings. Initially, they approached the government wanting to help redevelop Ghana's port. This has been on the table since early 2000s. Now, the, Andrew raises about five issues. He raises an issue of an illegal award. He essentially says that without subjecting MPH to the competitive and transparent tendering process, the former president, Mahama, uh, essentially um, gave the deal to MPS without giving a fair consideration to other companies that may have been interested. So essentially said he violated public procurement laws. And then number two, that the agreement itself was lopsided that MPS or MPH, Meridian Port Holdings, was awarded 
the contract and sign the concession agreement with GPHA to form MPS, which then includes uh, Bolore 35%, APM terminals 35%, and GPHA initially 30%. Essentially, Andrew's report says that the agreement was lopsided and skewed against Ghana. MPH had exclusive operations extended from 30 to 35 years, starting from 2019. One big issue that we all covered and spoke about was the tax breaks. So that's issue number three. So there was an illegal award. The agreement wasn't, the very, wasn't in our favor. And that we gave them an initial tax break of $1.5 billion. Um, actually, $832 million, I should say. $832 million. Now, this again came to Parliament, but Parliament didn't do a good job. So that he raises the tax break issue. And that Parliament didn't scrutinize the deal properly. Then also that in 2016, um, MPS did a meeting in Amsterdam where Ghana's 30% share was halved to 15. Don't forget, Bolore had 35% of this arrangement. APM at 35%, GPH at 30%. But Andrew's story also points out that our shares were diluted on the blind side of GPH from 30 to 15%. And then on the political side, we know that 2016 was an election year. A lot of MPP MPs raised issues about this agreement in Parliament. In fact, if you follow the parliamentary hazard in the debates, people like Antonia Couture say, Mark Esibe Yeboa, um, Kwabnat Daku Mensa, MP for Takradi, Che Mensa Bunsu, all raised issue with this in the lead up to the election. Now, the, the big issue that Andrew raises is that it looks like there's a pact of silence between the NDC and MPP on Bolore. And that when MPP came into office first, they appointed Peter McMenu to be on the board who tried to sort of renegotiate part of the deal. There was a cabinet report, a committee chaired by Titus Glover, MP for Tema East, who's also the deputy minister of transport. And the report was very, very damning. Essentially said that the deal was a ripoff and that government should renegotiate the deal with immediate effect. Okay. Now, Andrew's report suggests that somehow, in fact, even within that same period, Dankwa Institute, which is an MPP leaning think tank, held a press conference where they said the deal was not in the interest of Ghana and that if in 60 days Ghana didn't renegotiate the deal, they would go to court. Now, Andrew's report suggests that it looks like the MPP has cooled down. They raised a lot of red flags about this deal in 2016. They come to office, set up a committee to look into the report. This is not a good deal for Ghana. DI says they'll go to court. Somehow, the whole issue has died down. So this is the summary of the issue. Contra wasn't properly awarded. The agreement didn't favor Ghana. Our shares were whittled down. Tax breaks were off the charts. And then the MPP and NDC seem to have colluded not to talk about this. Then he also talks about who the man Vincent Bolloré is. And I'll come to Andrew on that. Apparently controls port interests from Nouakchott to Point Noir, Mauritania to Congo. Incredible. I'll show you the map shortly. But I wanted to do something first. Two years ago, in February, I brought the now director of the Ghana Ports, he's called Michael Luguje, into this studio. He sat in this chair opposite me. And I asked him a few questions about this deal. I want to suggest some of the things I asked him in 2019 about this arrangement before I talked to my guests and also go into who Vincent Bolloré is and why this is such a big issue. So here are some of the highlights of my interview with uh, Luguje. Set up an interministerial committee to review the contract we entered into with MPS. And they came up with certain conclusions. This is correct, right? You can confirm that there was an interministerial committee that reviewed the MPS project. Yeah, yes. Good. Can you confirm some of the findings that we have seen in the documents that we have intercepted? For example, we have learned that on the financial side, Volume of containers handled by GPHA and other licensed container handling companies will decline by at least 60%. And that's going to affect labor and cargo handling equipment. This is a conclusion that we got from that report that we have. They said revenue presently being earned by GPHA will decline. And they give six different areas of revenue decline. Container steel drawing revenue will decline from 10 million to four million dollars. Containers shore handling revenue will decline 
from 38 million to 17 million. So that's a 56% decline. Royalties revenue on MPS operations will decline from 24 million to 6.5 million. That's a 73% decline. Terminal area rent revenue from MPS terminal will also decline. Beth occupancy revenue will decline. Port dues revenue on MPS container operations will decline. These are astonishing figures that they are, they are putting together. Have you, have you seen or read or have you got any hint of this financial analysis that is projecting a very ominous revenue situation for the port post MPS? Yes, I mean, like you said, the, there was an interministerial committee that was set up, um, chaired by the Honorable Deputy Minister for Transport, to look at the, the MPS Terminal 3 project agreement. Mm -hmm. And the committee reviewed the entire concession agreement and made some observations. Mm which they refer to um, the government for consideration. Of course, the, the explanation is simple, that that concession agreement is meant to build a state-of-the-art container terminal, mm -hmm. which once is built with money to handle containers, you mm. expect container traffic to move to that terminal. And naturally, if container traffic is moving from the port, what port authority is handling today to that terminal, mm. it has also moved with the revenues associated with it. So that is, that is, that is just, uh, those are logical facts. But then they go further to say that if this agreement is implemented and changed, yeah. GPHA, which you run, will be in a financial crisis by 2020. So it's not simply a loss of revenue from container that's coming down. They are saying that you be in financial crisis, mm -hmm. you have idle labor, you have idle space, and you have idle equipment. They say you will not generate enough revenue to even pay salaries. In fact, Graphic wrote a story five, when was this? Graphic wrote a story February 5, Dela Rasilo Clue, and she estimates that you will lay off a minimum of 1,200 workers. This is her analysis. So take this one by one. Is it true that you could be in financial crisis by 2020? Okay. Um, the explanation we have always given is that if you are doing a certain component of business and part of it is going to go away, naturally, it is going away with the revenues associated with it. So naturally, your revenue will drop compared to what you, you probably was, would have were, were earning. So that's a fact that some, the, if the container business moves to the new terminal, it has to move with the associated revenues. And what it simply means is that container activity that you are doing today, if it moves, it means you wouldn't need the same numbers that you are using today to handle a lesser volume of business. These, these, are, these are just logical facts. And there's nothing in the agreement that says that the people who work for you at GPHA will be absorbed by MPS? No, the agreement did not talk about transfer of, direct transfer of labor from GPHA to MPS. So, so the analysis that 1,200 workers could lose their jobs is correct? Yeah, those are analysis that um, that were done on the basis of how much business is going to go away and how much you know revenue is also going to be lost to gpha on the basis of which there's a need to cut down costs and in trying to cut down costs you have to cut down costs on various levels including labor related costs so those are analysis that were done on that basis so number one you are going to lose revenue number two you are going to sack people Number three, we are going to have idle space and equipment. Yet, we are given tax concessions, which I can't calculate that overall. Kojo Akoto wrote an article that, that suggested that it was in the hundreds of millions of, of dollars. But 
again, the, the, the analysis the Interministerial Committee did suggests that, for example, there's an exemption from stabilization levy estimated at $145 million. It will take effect after 2017. There will be waiver cons uh, withholding tax exemptions, dividend tax on shareholder for 20 years, a 20 year tax free dividend for MPH, VAT NHIO waived on certain procurement items, $26 million. Exemption for corporate income tax for 10 years, applicable under GIPC Act, 15% corporate income tax after the waiver of a 10 year period. It, it doesn't make sense to me that we are given tax exemptions of this amount. Parliament has approved this. Yet we are also going to lose revenue for the existing company, which will also have to sack people. So essentially, you are running a company that's going to be useless in the next two years. That is not correct to say the company is going to be useless. GPH uh, is not going to be useless. Because GPH's um, business covers several cargo types. We handle fuel types of cargo, apart from containers. Though container is the most lucrative of all the cargo types that we handle through our ports. And therefore, if a component of that container business is going to go away, mm -hmm. then of course you feel, you feel the bite. Now, it is also not correct that we are going to sack people. There's no confirmation that we are going to sack people. We are only looking at scenarios, you know, possible scenarios to deal with the revenue that is going to be lost and the fact that the activity we are doing today concerning container handling is going to reduce with the coming into uh, operation of the new terminal. So what are we going to benefit from the terminal then? I think the terminal is meant to attract bigger ships to our port. So that was uh, two years ago, February 2019. Let, let me start with Andrew. And Andrew, thank you for joining us. So that was uh, uh, Michael Luguje. I spoke to him two years ago. Just to give the context of what the issues were at the time. We were very concerned about workers losing their jobs, about the tax waivers that had come up. And because some of the issues uh, Andrew raises now hadn't come up yet properly. Andrew, good evening. Thanks for joining us on The Point of View. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. What gave you interest in the, the Ghana case? Because I noticed you did a bit of work on, on Vincent Bolloré in other countries. So just give me some context to your interest in the issue and how long you've been working on the story. Well, I heard that two years ago, a contact of mine gave me a copy of the ministerial report that had been done by the Ministry of Transport, was commissioned by the economic management team under Mohamed Bolloré. Uh, in the early part, just after the Akufo Adu administration had come in. So that's my starting point. Someone had showed me this report, said this has not been published, um, and that was at, at about this, but about the same time as you did that interview with Michael Luguja. Um So I looked at it, and I thought this is extremely interesting. I, I don't know why it's remained secret, uh, it had already been done a, a year beforehand, and some of the stuff in it was very interesting indeed, um, and that the public deserved to know more about it. They, know, they deserved to know everything that was in this uh, report that was done by the minister, by the, by the ministry. It was clear, I mean, they, there was a special committee formed to investigate the terms uh, between GPHA and uh, MPS on the construction of Terminal 3 at Tema. Uh, the, it's a very thorough, it's an, it's an excellent investigation. It is uh, a model of the type. And uh, they it's very extensive. They called witnesses. They had all sorts of experts there. And uh, they produced this report, and then nothing had happened. The, the report just sort of was suppressed. At mm. first, this interesting me because I wondered why it was that the Kufa Adu administration had not tried to blame uh, President Mahama for it, because possibly the most interesting uh, revelation in it is, is one of the first one on the first page, which is that um, the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority was in the process of uh, setting out tenders to construct 
and to operate the new container terminal. There have been a lot of interest and been an awful lot of work done by many different private companies to qualify for the competition. Uh, Ghanaian civil servants have done a huge amount of work to prepare for all that. And then suddenly, on November the 14th, 2014, President Mahama said, stop. Uh, and he ordered, and we will hear, I hope Mr. Animo can tell us about that, because as, as I understand it, he was the person who was, he was instructed to stop the tender process and to give it all to MPF. Mm. Now, uh, I don't know Ghana law, but I, I understand that competitive uh, tendering is a requirement for government procurement. So there's a big question right there. The decision was not recorded, it was secret, and yet it was implemented. And that was the starting point for the whole thing. So the, my work, my research, consisted in two parts, was to write up and to verify what the ministerial report had said, and then to see what had happened in the intervening period. Because there was some attempt to do some, uh, to take up some aspects of the report, uh, the president, for instance, in the middle of 2019, uh, asked for MPS and the unions to make an agreement yeah. to handle more. Andrew, the, Andrew, I'll come to that. I, I want to go yeah, back. Sorry. I want to give. I want a, 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 a context that is important. Your story situated the Ghana issue in the issue, in the whole West Africa subregion, and Vincent Bolloré's monopoly in 15 ports. So I wanted to know, our, and this is the, the, the chart you put out. So essentially showing Norkshot, Dakar, Conakry, Freetown, Monrovia, San Pedro, Abidjan, Lome, Tema, all this. I, are you saying that Vincent Bolloré controls all these ports or has interest in the companies that manage all these 15 ports? Is that what? Um, I don't. I don't have, uh, no, I, I don't know all those other ports. I couldn't even tell you uh, off by heart which they are. But the advantage to a company which uh, is operates a port, container handling, and is also in alliance with the biggest manufacturer of containers because, uh, and with the biggest shipper of containers, it's, it's very easy to imagine. Mayors, and Bollore, Maersk is, you know, you'll see that written on practically every container you've ever seen. M-A-E-R-S-K. They're the Maersk containers and shipping. They are in a joint relationship with Vincent Bollore, who operates all these ports. So if you've got the trains, the trucks, the ships, and the containers, you're obviously in a very, very strong position to, uh, to, to dominate the pricing structure and if all your ports are all in a line, they're all in the same region, then your dominance of the market is going to be even stronger. And that's why Bollore and Mez, they don't have ports all over Africa. They're concentrated in that region from Pointe Noir in uh, Congo Brazzaville in the south and Dakar the furthest north. But who is Vincent Bollore? Because I, I noticed we interchanged the company Bolloré Logistics with the man Vincent Bolloré. So what's the what's the relationship there? Well, I mean, uh, you know, sometimes some companies have just got a uh, a big man's name, uh, and it's really run by other people. And sometimes it's uh, the big man is the big man and does does uh, provide the direction and control. And and that's very much the case with Vincent. Bolloré, he is, uh, he is uh, a leader. He's a, a very strong personality and he, he's a very committed uh, businessman. He's a, a billionaire and an entrepreneur in the old style. And so, so basically he has, certainly until recently, he, he has been in very much in charge of uh, all of the, the policies and particularly in the relationship with local politicians. Because the other thing you need to realize about the way Bolloré works is that every port that he's worked in, he gets a good commercial advantage, at least partly because of his relationship with the local politicians. 
that's been a key part of his business success. Mm. So in, it appears he's very influential in Francophone Africa, so that Ghana would probably be the first major Anglophone country that he, he has significant interest in the port. What? Yes, and wh uh, there's a very strong Francophone connection, though, because uh, Burkina Faso and Mali and Niger, a lot of their goods have to come through Tema. So there's already a, a, a strong Francophone connection with Ghana anyway. Fair enough. And then you also spoke about some of his more recent challenges in France on, on the basis of some of the things he did in Togo and, and, and Guinea. Su suggesting that the French authorities may not be very happy with him. Oh, that's correct. Yes, he's going to uh, face a trial uh, later this year uh, over his relationship with the Togolese president, Yassin, uh, for Nyasingbe. And it, because 10 years ago, he donated, he is accused of um, donating a very high-priced uh, political consultancy outfit to help him uh, get re-elected, and that in return for that, in return for that, uh, he won enormous concessions on running his business in Lomé Port. That that was the deal, and uh, he actually confessed. They made a plea bargain. He made a. He confessed that he had done this. He arranged this this with the French prosecutors in return for confessing that he had done this. Uh, they arranged for him to pay a fine. However, when they came to court at the end of February, uh, the judge said, no, this is too shocking. This is, this is a, a really bad deal. You are a very important company. You represent France abroad. What you have done here is to compromise Togo's sovereignty. And I think that's unacceptable. So they agreed to pay the fine that said that, that, that but through the rest of the plea bargain out, and he's going to have to face trial for that. At about the same time, in 2010, he was accused of making a similar deal with Alpha Conde in Guinea, um, but that case didn't go ahead. And uh, it, but I think it, in general, you can say he's a. It, what can one say? I mean, he's a very tough businessman, and he's uh, got the reputation as a very hard businessman, and uh, in some cases, he's, um, well, I, do, I don't want to get on the wrong track. Yes, <laughs> fair enough, I get the point. I, st I'll stay, I with, stay, with, stay with me. I have legal responsibilities. So I, can, yeah, I have no intention. And so do we, so do we. Thank you. Stay with us. I'll take a short break. When I come back, I'll bring the former DG in, because as you rightly said, a lot of what yeah. happened in terms of the award of the contract, the agreements, and the tax breaks, would have happened with Mr. Namus' knowledge. So I'm going to talk to him when I come back, but I want you to stay on. And I also bring in uh, Mr. Osu Kranting. This is a point of view, trying to understand this port issue and also the relationship, what the risks are of having one company play such an important role in ports from all over the, the sub-region, whether it has benefits or disadvantages. We'll take your comments as well. Stay with us. Because you pay attention, because you know more than one angle, and see more than one opportunity, we bring you Build a Bet, multiple legs, as a single bet on one game. Raising the odds, and elevating your experience. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Bet responsibly, not for persons below 18 years. Good day energy drink keeps you going. Available in major supermarkets and shops near you. 
excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advert is FDA approved. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight we're trying to unravel or get more insight into a story uh, put together by Africa for Confidential. Various bits and pieces of the story had been reported in the Ghanaian media, but Andrew Weyer, the journalist, put it together and it raised a lot of eyebrows. How Vincent Bolloré won control of Ghana's biggest port. Let me come to Richard Annamu. Thank you for joining us, sir. Um, just for clarity's sake, what period... Did you work at the Ghana ports? What's your relationship with the ports? Yeah, good, good evening, Bernard. Um, I've been in the Port Authority for close to 30 years, um, starting as a young engineer in 1982. Wow. After doing the national service there, yes. And uh, I had a port, the opportunity to uh, work at the two ports, both Tama Takrati, and uh, finally ending up at uh, the headquarters. So, um, yes. Within which period were you DG of the port? Um, I think that was uh, from uh, 2014, uh, 2012, I think. Yeah, 2012 to 2016. Yeah. Okay, so you are familiar with this. So, first point, what was your initial reaction when you read the report in Africa Confidential? Because I'm sure you've read it. Yes, uh, when I read it the first time, I. I, I I thought that when I saw the headline, I thought that he was there was something really confidential about it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what I read was basically uh, a kind of a, an, an avenue for uh, the report of the ministerial committee, and then the the, the uh, threat from the Dankwa Buzia team, uh, threatening the government and all that uh, being used. He being used as a channel. And uh, fortunately, today, uh, Andrew himself has uh, admitted in his first statement to you that uh, he was uh, given a, a, the document by a contact um, uh, in Ghana. So uh, it, it kind of reinforced uh, my belief that, yeah, this was something more of political than, than something else. Um, so I didn't, I reading through it, I didn't really see anything inside it that was uh, confidential because all the information that was uh, put in that paper or that article was already in the public domain. There was nothing confidential about it. But weren't you alarmed at the number of ports that Bolloré appears to have interest in in the sub-region and also the specific issues raised about how the contract was awarded, the nature of the agreement, and the tax breaks? Obviously those should concern you, somebody who's worked at the port for, for this long? Um, and, and no, I wasn't alarmed because uh, I'm fully aware of what is happening in the West Coast of Africa uh, as far as the maritime is concerned. And uh, most of the things that he stated in there are false. Our next door neighbor, Togo, um, the, the building uh, is an uh, uh, embassy, it's built, has got a terminal there. I mean, the build that uh, MSC is a main competitor of uh, uh, Bolloré. Okay, uh, Grimaldi has a terminal in, in Nigeria. I've been there before. Uh, I know that uh, DP World has a terminal in, uh, in Senegal. Um, so uh, to make it look like uh, the, the ports are being controlled of West Africa are being controlled by Bolloré, uh, absolutely is absolutely false. Apart from that, Ghana is Ghana, Ghana port is not just a port. We have Tema and Takra report. And our vision was to grow these ports uh, to become, even though within the country, to become a rival ports. And Bolloré is not in Takra report. Um, so uh, all those claims that he put in there, are, they, they are not supported by any evidence. No. Of course, you've got to go back and look at the history of Bolloré, if you care to know. I mean, it's like, uh, from what I know, I've read before, I mean, on them long before. Um, in the saying that uh, they were prepared to take the, the bull by the horn when the West African coastline um, had nothing as far as 
uh, maritime traffic is concerned, maritime infrastructure. All our infrastructure then was sponsored by the World Bank. World Bank and not private people. And I can tell you that even as, as, as late as 2000, when we started the development of Temple Port, uh, I was personally involved. And the World Bank said no. They were not going to give us money to dredge and start the expansion of Temple Port in 2000. And that is how we started this whole process. So uh, Bolloré, I know, I mean, I'm not defending Bolloré, of course, but these are factual matters, you know, that they, I mean, elected to go into, I mean, West Africa and spend their money, their resources uh, in the developing infrastructure or helping the countries to develop the port infrastructure. I would not, and if they have been successful, I mean, out of the desert, I do not see that to be something that is worrying. No, because okay. they're, they're not, they've not stated, he's not stated anywhere in there that um, uh, they've done that to the exclusion or there are some, uh, I mean, laws or something that have been passed that have prevented uh, the, 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 the other companies from taking part. No, that's what I said. I have been to, I've been to Togo. And at the time that MSC was going to Togo, I was there myself to see. In fact, I had the opportunity of meeting the, uh, the, the owner of uh, MSC in Togo when they were negotiating with the Togolese government uh, to put up the terminal there. So uh, to make it so look like from... Uh, uh, no, no problem. Uh, let, let, me, let me come to a specific place in which your name was mentioned, that... Okay. Um, a high aide in the office of the president, one highly placed expert on the affair, told Africa Confidential that um, you were instructed um, as acting director of GPHA to discontinue the tendering and engage with MPS. And if this is true, then this was illegal and a breach of the rules of government procurement. Because we have 56 companies, 20 had been shortlisted for the construction had wasted all their time, another 15 had bid for the contract, and we've done all kinds of work, and then you were instructed by President Mahama to just engage with MPS exclusively. Is this correct? This is certainly not correct. I mean, when you use the word instructed, it's like kind of a military command where you give instructions and there is no question of why. Okay? I mean, uh, here, the, the president might have had a final decision as to what should be done. But that's based, that, that was based on facts. That, that was based on the circumstances of the situation. What happened? We had gone on tender because NPS, NPS refused at that time, you know, or did not intend to spend that amount of money to go into the open sea because they had proposed to put up just two beds, you know, opposite their exist, the then existing beds. And we said, no, we wanted to go up into the open sea and develop not just some one or two container beds, but co construct a, I mean, a port that can have about 15 to 18 beds. That was the objective. Eventually, even though we went out, because they were still hesitant, they were not sure, eventually we went out, and then they came back and said, look, f f fine, fair, fair, fair for us. We are prepared to do what you want us to do. And don't forget, NPS but, but did was that did that merit the truncation of the already begun competitive procurement process? I think that's the issue here. Uh, as far as I, I'm concerned, yes, it, it merited because we are going to go two stages: first to tender for the construction works, and second to go for an operator. And if we had within ourselves a company that was already an operator and that company was prepared in which we had an interest was prepared to do what we wanted and also get themselves into the operation then it was only fair and proper that they, they fall in if they, they were willing to go according to what we were going to instruct them to do so so, that, that so was those despite the fact that, that despite the fact that about 20 or so companies had played different roles and had been engaged in a procurement process, a directive from the president to truncate on the basis of a superior offer from MPS you thought was justified? No, I, I, I do not think that if you put it that way, it will, I mean, you make it look so simple as it is. 
I can tell you that even, even I mean, I'm not saying that that's what happened, but even in international tenders, even under the World Bank, there's always a clause there that the, 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 the employer is not bound to take the lowest bidder. So that is, that is, that's a fundamental rule. But that is not the issue. What I'm saying is that this is an operator who was with us and had agreed eventually to do what we were going to do. Okay? And it wasn't done secretly. No. They proved it. They went ahead to develop first, the, uh, I mean, improve significantly the terminal at uh, the terminal two. And that's where they invited the, the president at that time to come and have a look at it. That's I mean, a commissioner. That's number one. And then the major one was that they agreed to also do the motorway from Tetakwashi right down to the ports, okay, through the uh, uh, the hospital road mm. at, 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 as part of the project. I'll, I'll come to the motorway separately because I have a lot of questions no, 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 there. No, no, no. But but let's deal with yeah, two. That, two. That, that, that was that was that was that was a cardinal issue. Okay. That was a cardinal issue in taking that decision. That MPS, if you're willing to do that, and on top without any sovereign guarantee, we are willing to listen to you. Fair enough. Um, yes. There were issues of the fact that shortly after they were awarded the contract and the concession was signed, the terms of the agreement were altered by a deal of amendment, which dramatically skewed the balance of power against the Ghana Ports Authority. An example being of the extension of the operations was literally from uh, 30 to 35 years. Then there was also the very vexed issue of the tax breaks. Again, you are familiar with these matters. W what's your comment that for a project that was worth about $1.2 billion, Parliament gave tax breaks worth over $800 million. Yeah, uh, Bernard, you have mixed up a whole number of issues. First, let's deal with the issue of the amendment of the concession. What we did was that MPS already had a concession with GPHA. That was for 20 years. And as of 2015, they said that are almost about nine years left to go on that existing concession. So what we did was to amend that existing concession to cover for the new works. And that concession at that time was talking about only 500 meter key without even a breakwater, without even a, I mean, a dredging into the sea. The new works was building a new port. I repeat, a new port with a breakwater of over four kilometers dredging the harbor, the old beds had a, a draft of only 11 and a half meters maximum for two beds. The new port was going, coming up with 17 beds, all 60 meters deep, dredging in hard rock and reclaiming land over 127 hectares of land, including a rail terminal. All of this was part of it. So you were, so we amended the existing concession agreement that was signed during the NPP era. And so we amended that to take care of the new conditions. That's number one. Number two is that 20 years was for the, the existing concession, which included exclusivity period of 20 years. The new concession, even though that amount of money was running into billions of dollars, was extended, was made for 35 years from the first day of uh, operation at the new terminal. 35 years. But not 35 years exclus exclusivity. No. Far from it. Fantastic. The, the, the exclusivity was for 12 years minimum. Exclusivity meant that within a certain geographical region uh, of terminal ports, okay, I think it's about 20 nautical miles or so, you cannot, during that 12 years period, you cannot allow another container terminal sponsored or supported by GPG to operate. Call it the economic, the, econ the economic recovery period, during which period they're supposed to recover the investment. Okay. That was 12 years. And we put it this way that during those 12 years, they should recover. However, if within those 12 years, they are unable to recover as a result of, I mean, uh, lack of traffic or, I mean, economic issues, they can extend maximum six, six more years to 18. So the exclusivity period extends between 12 to 18 years maximum, after which it will be opened up for competition. Can as you, far as, good. as far as 
they're not as far as container traffic is concerned. Fair enough. Can you comment on the tax break issue? On taxation? Yes. Demands. There's a difference between investing in a private property and investing in a public property. I mean, if, for example, Move and Pay or Kempiski decides today that they are closing down their, their, their hotel, no problem. They can close down. And I'm told even now, because of the hippie, Holiday Inn has closed down. Nobody can force them. That is private, you see. But here you are, the port is public. So you have a private investment on public property. I repeat, this is private investment on public property. And uh, MPS cannot, under any circumstances, get up one day and say that for A, B, C, and D, we are closing down the port. That cannot happen. It cannot happen. GPAT will step in. Okay, that's the first point. The second point is that if, if you look at, you can go into the network and open any page, you see the World Bank procurement document. It is stated very clear that for bids, where assuming the GP, GPG had gone or the Ghana government had gone for a World Bank loan and invested in that project, there is a clause in there. Formally, they used to state clearly that there would be no taxes. This time, it stated under, I think, Article 14.7 that all duties, taxes, and levies should be included in the rates in the bidder's price, which means that if we had gone for a loan from the World Bank and offered that to construct that facility, and MPS was a bidder, then MPS would have put in their tender documents, analyzed the duties and the taxes and all those things, and put them as part of their bids. OK? So the, 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 the net effect is that we would be paying the tax, because we have to pay them. It's part of the price. OK, so that is why in almost all these where there is public in, uh, private investment on public, <clears throat> property, there is the exemption for taxation. All right. Because the end result is that the tax will be borne by the state. Fair enough. Let so, me so, take. So, so that's the fundamental issue. Th yes. Thank you. Let me let me bring in Daniel Ousu Kranting, former general secretary okay. of the Maritime and Dock Workers Union. Thank you for your patience. Again, what was your reaction to the story? Because I know you were quite involved in some of the worker concerns and possibly agitations when the MPS discussion was going on. Now, I know you are not, you are not holding yourself as a general secretary because of legal issues, but when you read the, the story from the Africa Confidential, what did you make of it? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. I think that this discourse is very, very important. And I also think that it's an eye-opener for our country in terms of negotiations of deals and uh, contracts, um, um, where we sometimes, after the contracts, then we sit down and do post-mortems post like this, uh, where things that might have gone wrong and we don't seem to learn. Now, when when um, a friend sent me the, the Africa Confidential Reports, um, of, of course, I found um, some new and interesting things and beyond the, what I was used to in terms of the, the ministerial reports. And um, I have followed Bolloré. I'm a unionist, and I have, I have followed Bolloré. And I think that um, some of the issues that had come up um, are not too different. Um, it's like one standard way of dealing with um, the African ports and whatnot. And the, and the tension that had been coming ar around them had been going on for some time. So I, I found it also very interesting um, in some of the new things that were, were reported on in the, in, in the report. Of course, I also don't have the, the facility to verify things. But as, at that time, you know, when I would say some of us were providing leadership in the, in the, in the union, we, we, had, we had serious problems, very, very serious problems. And as a, as a nation, you realize that if you look at you know, various contracts that have signed, they come out almost with the same problem. 
And that, that has been my, my worry. As I, are, as you I surprised, to... are you surprised that despite the cabinet report that really said that the agreement was not very good for Ghana and the recommendations, as we speak, <clears throat> not much has changed. Uh, MPS is still running. Bolloré still has it to share, as does APM terminals. Uh, that, does it surprise you that the, the level of animosity towards the deal that the MPP had in 2016 doesn't seem to extend into the new government, even though they did a report that showed that the agreement wasn't in our favor? The, 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 the first thing I would say is that um, I think the, the, the government's decision to set up a ministerial committee have been very laudable in the sense that it democratized information. It's 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 kind of demystified the the opacity in, in terms of the, the the contract and brought a lot of things out. And for that one, I think the government must be giving credit for it. But it has always been said that philosophers have analyzed problems in many ways. The problem, however, is to address the you know the issues. So once you you are you come out, you know which I. I, I am saying that credit must be provided for providing the opportunity for even all of us to know how wrong the thing was. But however, the, 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 the delay in, in resolving the matters or in going for renegotiation or whatever is also a source of worry. And I, I think for that, for that one, we need to say that um, that feed dragging has not also help the nation. I'm talking about the nation. Do you think in, in that general. do you think but, do you think we should renegotiate the deal at this point or is what under the bridge? But but I I I, I think that somewhere along the line where we have some positive things we must talk about them. Where there are negativities we must also talk about them. For example, the MPS um, uh, contracts did not touch on river containers. But for some reason, around the same time, the river container business was taken away with some reasons that didn't have any, any serious, uh, as far as I am concerned, does not have any, any basis in terms of the fact that containers were getting missing. But evidence that should be alluded to support this fact did not come until the workers stood up. And it was around this um, whole struggle that they got a refer to number. So it's like going to the bush, a hunter going to the bush for to hunt for uh, a deer or something, and then he picks a tortoise. So even though that was not part of the contract, a way was found to to for DPH to lose, you know, something very valuable that as Mr. Namu is sitting there, he is the one. I mean, during his time, that some of these very important facilities were put up, the river containers, and. I went there. The place was like a cemetery. But because of the, the how workers stood up, today, if we go to the place, if we go to the river container yard, mm. they don't even have a place to put the containers. Okay. And, and that, that, for me, has been a very positive. And that, the, the government had to respond to a certain pressure from the workers and the, and the union. All right. And, uh, to, and, to, and to provide the, and to change the situation in terms of the river container. But a lot of things are standing, I agree, that must be done. And I think that the, the earlier that is done, but the better it is. I'll, I'll take a short meeting. break and come back and take concluding comments from Andrew and the two, uh, Mr. Amnamu as well. Stay with us. This is the point of view, trying to get to the bottom of this big issue with the post. Stay with us. It is another beautiful day in the lovely city of Accra. And just as expected, everyone is up to something. Busy day as usual. Ah, Papa. So Kuma has also left us. Hmm. Oh, others are getting ready for school. Guys, we are late. Hurry up. Welcome. We're coming. And in the busy streets of Accra, the mates are calling out to passengers. Whatever you have planned for today, don't leave home without your nose mask. Wearing a mask at all times will protect you from the coronavirus. And even after vaccination, 
continue to wear a mask and follow all existing protocols. Ghana needs you. Let's do the right thing. Wear your mask. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Information, the Ghana Health Service, and our donor partners. Welcome back to The Point of View. We're trying to get to the bottom of this story that was originally put together by the Africa Confidential. Uh, the author, Andrew, uh, we are still with us. Andrew, just concluding remarks, I, I know I um, asked Richard a lot of questions that you may want to comment on, but whatever response you want to give, I just wanted your final take on why, what you make of the fact that the, the MPP seems to have dragged his feet. After such a high-quality report they put together, there doesn't seem to have been much that has changed. So is that also partly because of the charm of Bolloré and his power? That's my final question to you, Andrew. Yeah, well, he's, um, I, I don't know. I think Bolloré's influence was probably greatest at the very beginning of all this, um, because basically now what Bolloré and Mayer want to do is to uh, resist any change. Uh, and the big things have already happened. But my main thing I want to point out is to say that uh, I have got nothing to do with Ghanaian politics. Uh, and Mr. Anamu said it was uh, political, and that, it's, that is not true at all. I was given the document in, in London. I have got no part of Ghanaian politics, and you can go through vast issues of Africa Confidential and see if we are biased in favor of MPP or the NDC. And, and so it's much more simpler point is look at the whole report. It says bad things, if you want to look at it like that. Uh, it says that both the NTP and the NDC did bad things. So, so where does that leave me in terms of being political? I would say, I would say not. And the other thing is that uh, it, we wouldn't, I mean, we're not fools. We wouldn't put this report into, uh, I'm not saying that nobody had ever seen the, the ministerial report before, but it wouldn't be a story if it was all in the public domain and it had all been dealt with. So, and I, mm. I say it, it, that's, uh, that's my main takeaway. I mean, I think this is unfinished business. And I, I think that if I would make one little comment about Ghanaian politics, you've got a hung parliament, you've got some blame attaches to the ruling party, you've got some blame attaches to the NDC. And as a result, neither of the big political parties really want to talk about it. But there's still some issues there. Uh, and, and really about what about um, how, what Ghanaian people, what the Ghanaian exchequer gets out of this. It could have got a lot more, mm. uh, and it's just is not necessarily a lot more. Thank you. Richard, Anamu, thank you. Your, my final question. You said one of the reasons we gave this to MP3 was the MPS was the motorway. Well, the motorways has still not been done. So I don't know what your comment is as you wrap this up. What, what do you make of the fact that the motorway is still in the state in which it is, although the reason the contract was given to them was because of the promise to renovate the motorway? Yeah, thank you, Bernard. Um, uh, that, is, that is the price we have to pay um, when we put too much politics into uh, certain governmental institutions or decisions, um, especially certain projects that are carried out. Uh, but I'm happy, um, before I proceed with that, with... Uh, uh, what uh, Daniel Uzukranti has stated. Um, you see, in law, there is uh, always, uh, when the lawyers are given some interpretation and they want to look at the Constitution, they will say that you go back to the framers of the Constitution to see what was in their mind at the time that uh, they were making that law. In the same way, what was in the mind of those of us who were there at that time when we were putting up this whole project together? I mean, why did we have uh, to think about developing the pond terminal? I mean, why did we have to think about the motorway as part of it? Why did we have to think about the hospital roads and even another parallel road from Sakumono right down to link up with the, uh, with the motorway? Why did we have to think about that? Why did we have to think about the fact that even under the concession agreement, you know, we're looking at, I mean, beyond that, we're saying, look, rural traffic. We, we have to end it here. So it's been worth it, you, you think? Okay. It's, it's, it's been worth it. It's been worth it. And... And what is available now is telling us that, for example, already the, 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 the Terminal 3, remember, what MPS has <laughs> we, we developed? Don't have, we don't have time. For themselves. 
There are seven, seven, uh, 30 more bets to go. Fantastic. Thank Take you. Yeah, thank we'll, you very we'll, much. We'll pursue this. Thank back. you. So we're speaking to Richard Anamu, former DG Ghana Ports uh, Harbors Authority, Daniel Osu Kranting, former General Secretary of uh, Maritime and Dock Workers Union, Andrew Wire, uh, edit, a journalist of Africa Confidential. My name is Bernard Avle. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Uh, stay with CTTV. The business dashboard is next. View is sponsored by First National Bank. First National Bank. How can we help you?